OK, thank you. Um, so this slide, sort of what, what you said, of my coworkers like to refer to me as the doctor. Um, so there's a the little, my supersonic screwdriver. I unfortunately didn't bring it with me today. Um, but I have, you know, FME around us. So we have that going for us. And then I was also formally known as FME Ninja. Um, so sort of some quick stats about us. We're not really necessarily a big shop. We have 10 floating licenses of FME desktop. Um, of which one of our people, he apparently has multiple desktops that he loves to use desktop on, so you have to tell him sometimes to uh, you know, reduce the load and just use one license instead. But then we also have now six um, server engines. We have been looking at FME Cloud, although um, we're limited by um, the support for uh, SDE. So some of our FME workspaces in the wintertime, we sort of have two big ones. They're going to be our snow plows and our road conditions. And then sort of year round, we have like our 511 events, our ITS devices, um, our ways stuff for traffic operations, and then our other day-to-day -day ETL processes that we use FME for. So snow, yay. So in Iowa, we have almost 25,000 lane miles of road. Um, and to maintain all that, we have about right around 900 different or 900 snow plows total. And then on a yearly basis, we use roughly 150,000 tons of salt and 18 to 24 million gallons of brine. I can't really quantify that beyond that. Um, but yeah, basically we have lots of snow stuff. So why do we track snow plows? Well, the cost of snow plow tracking 10% salt reduction equals $1.4 million in savings. But then we also do it for other reasons, such as uh, record keeping, um, auditing real use of materials, being able to do um, consistency within response. And then the bottom one is sort of, we archive all of our data so then in the future, if we partner with other um, university educational institution, institutions um, for research projects and other cool, interesting things. So our snow plows are basically big data collection machines in the wintertime. So we do like engine bus for diagnostic and performance. We have iPhone mounted in the cab for uh, plow camera images. Everything is now, all of our snow plows are a Wi-Fi hotspot. So everything connects up to the, um, to the system that we have. Uh, we have odometer readings, location heading and speed the different material types that they're putting down, the set rates, the air and road temperatures, and then the plow state of either being up or down. So we started the winter operations project before I started my internship. Uh, uh, we started the AVL stuff back in 2010. At that time we were about, we got about one ping per minute per truck. Um, FME server did a lot of the ETL between our vendor and our databases, and we utilized Geocortex um, for internal visual, visualization and reporting. Um, in 2012, all of our snow plows were equipped with our um, AVL vendor solution. And then when I sort of hopped on board in the summer of 2014, this is right before that actually, um, in 2014 we launched Track a Plow to the public. So it's a public facing application um, where you can see our real time snow plows. Um, we stored all of our data in KML files in Azure and then we used a network link KML file to link to ArcGIS Online, and the app was hosted in um, AUL, so it was a really cheap way to show our snow plows and stuff. And then in 2014, we launched our plow camera images to the public. So this is sort of a mini workflow of where you have um, your, um, the snow plow um, device sends it to our vendor, and then from our vendor we do uh, uh, connection to or, or dump it to Oracle and from Oracle we use FME to shove it out to the cloud. So 2014 to 2015 um, I somehow convinced my boss I was like hey we should look at AGOL. So we went to AGOL. That was kind of an unfortunate situation as I'll, I'll mention here in a little bit. Um, and we also increased our plow cameras to now we have 420 iPhones. So we get iPhone free with each data plan we create and so basically on each one of those phones is a custom iOS application that, that does a snapshot every five minutes or 10 minutes, depending on how they're configured, and shoves it back to the server. 
2015 to 2016, um, we updated the track plow again. Now we have two different vendors, so you have to deal with that sort of situation. Um, we improved performance with uh, AG AGOL feature collections. Who here has heard of feature collections? One, two, three, four people. That's great. You guys should learn more about it. It's really awesome. Um, the, and then we also did a soft launch of our winter cost calculator um, where we did sort of working out bugs and, and stuff with that. Now this past winter, we updated um, track plow. So now all of our snow plows are all equipped with our new vendor, which is ironically a Canadian company because apparently we have, we love Canadian people with, Ge whoops, with Geocortex and FME and our new AVL vendor. So now we get, instead of getting one minute pings, we actually now get 10 second pings and then we also get 15 second material and data pings. And this, this really allows us to, to do a lot more stuff with the data um, because it's a lot more dense. Um, and then one of the projects that I started on when I got back as intern was to create a, a row conditions sort of service for all of the surrounding states. So now we have row conditions for Nebraska, or North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. So if you're traveling in Iowa and sort of around those states, um, you could just pull this one uh, breast service in and it's stylized the same way, which unfortunately, or which fortunately we were able to work around um, and base off of how we style our data sets. Um, and then ironically, Minnesota started doing plow camps as well because we apparently lead and they really liked what we were doing um, and the public really gets use of it. So we added their snow plows into our track plow site. Um, and then we also officially launched winter cost calculator, I think in February, January or February um, as well. So this is a really simple workspace. So it's a little bit more than Don's five transformers, but hey, it gets the job done, right? Um, it's not complex really at all. Um, basically it takes from the database and it shoves it out to ArcGIS Online. And then here's our, our PlowCam one, which is even a little bit more easier. <laughs> basically doing the same sort of thing and we write it out to our SDE environment in addition to AGOL. So for track plow we were the first in the United States to make our data publicly accessible um, in real time. Uh, eight other states have now followed us, although I like to think that we still have the cleanest end client UI. Um, now three other states have plow cams in addition to Iowa, but we are still the only state that I've found that makes our data real time Avail available and free, and you don't have to really use any logins to get to it. So I'll show. So this is in real time of, we keep it running during the year so we can do, um, so when plows are out in the summer and stuff. Um, so you can see that sort of we do a route and we also get a total count of the trucks. So you can sort of see where the trucks are at in real time and this gets updated every two minutes, two to three minutes, I believe. So the next, okay, so that now sort of, did I skip over, okay. So we're going to operation stats. So in the millions, um, 2014 to 2015, I th think that was the year that we, uh, um, yeah, that was the year that we had major issues with our, our service. So as you can see, we all had almost 30 million requests um, that, was, that was a bad time. <laughs> um, and then since then, we've sort of figured out how ArcGIS Online works. We, were, we worked a lot with Esri to reduce the number of requests. A big one was editing. We had editing enabled. Uh, we just left that on by, by default. And that apparently, that helped contribute to this issue right here. And then once we figured that out, we uh, really reduced our number of requests, the client. So really, FME, and sort of our workflow process is about integration of data. So we have our database on the left, and then we use FME to shove it out to Esri with ArcGIS Online. And then you can do cool stuff like this. These are some of our um, shots that we got sent into us um, and posted on Twitter and stuff. So people like our local weather stations, they love this stuff. They're able to integrate it into their, their um, weather systems. And then you have Waze. And then you also have NOAA and the, the Mesonet that also archives our data. So really we have a lot of users of the data and even more potentially beyond this that we don't even know about because we just keep our data open and out there. 
So now I'll talk about our winner cost calculator a little bit. That this is our tool to help um, users who are the taxpayers of Iowa understand the cost of keeping the state-owned roads open and clear during winter. We provide um, information about material, labor, equipment, and overall total cost of to keep set each segment open. And you're also able to see costs on a statewide um, scale. And it tracks costs for the past 48 hours. So here's a work, workspace that's a little more um, complicated, but we do a lot of calculations and math and stuff in it. And this is the winner of the uh, 2017 State IT Innovation of the Year from State Scoop. So we're excited about that. We've also been featured on um, government technology and GCN. Esri's been pushing us for a lot and some other local um, apps and news outlets. So here's sort of, this is from a snapshot um, from our January 24th through 26th, we had an ice storm. So as you zoom in the numbers, and as you pan, the numbers on the bottom change, and then you can zoom in to, let's say here, we'll go over near, near my house. We can go right here. So there's IODOT home. So you can click on this segment and then you can see how much time we spent on the segment, how much time we spent applying materials to the segment, segment cost, segment total. Let's see if we can grab. Um, here's one with actually some data. So the thing with this as well is that we found, so if you have like clover, um, clover leaves like we have down here, uh, there may not be a ping necessarily on all the segments just because of how it works, but we're getting a lot better with this 10 second um, pings. So you can see sort of labor costs, pounds of salt, material usage per segment. So that's a, something that, that um, our people have um, really loved. And you can check this all out online too. It's gonna be posted. Actually, it's posted already. So, um, so some positive public feedback that we've had. So we love this comment. This is the awesome sauce, hashtag awesome sauce because we have awesome, oh, and then you, you can't forget about this one. Are there any other state DOTs as awesome as this one? So sort of so looking towards the future now, um, now that we're sort of, we keep leading the sort of, I guess we like to think we lead the nation in DOTs. So some cool things that we have in the back of our minds, not necessarily um, resources dedicated to them yet, are um, staff and um, common operating or common uh, off-the-shelf products for doing analysis stuff, uh, pushing more data out to the public than, we are, well, than what we already have currently, even more data integration. Um, potentially one of the cool things is to work with the plow data since we have plow pings and then our, our um, dynamic message signs along the roadway to warn drivers of using geofences if a plow enters a, an area with a, a DMS sign enough to trigger DMS sign automatically to warn people that there's a plow ahead um, and to slow down. And then the, the, this last one I think is really, really cool of doing predictive analytics. So based on past data, this segment is expected to be partially covered with an 85% confidence from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. tomorrow. So being able to do that. And then we also work with the National Weather Service that are sort of doing the same sort of predictive analytics in a way of to be able to better um, target their audience and so something that may be um, considered um, like not a watch, maybe a watch, like winter weather watch, but it impacts a big metro area. So say like Vancouver, it may now be upgraded from a watch to a warning based on um, impact of travel to the public. So now the other thing that we have is a lot of traffic. So um, we don't have a lot of traffic jams. But when we do, they're usually caused by accidents or secondary accidents. So this one was actually an accident. So um, this one is for some of you people out there that have issues with people that don't like their data open. We worked with um, someone that was really closed-minded at first, and then we sort of got her to open up, um, which I think is cool um, to make the 511 data, um, so our traveler information systems for those of you not from the United States, um, available to the public. So we did that, and then she really was excited with that, so then we continued on to road conditions. And then the next year, we transitioned everything over to ArcGIS Online. Um, we 
signed the uh, Connected Citizen Partner Program with Waze, which I'll talk about here in a couple slides. Um, we added ITS devices, um, Interex abnormal traffic, so comparison of traffic. That one is not really maintained necessarily anymore because no one has been really using it. And then also archiving historic road conditions. So if people request road conditions for a certain day at a certain time, we're able to fulfill those requests. Um, some ETL operations for uh, 2016 and 2017, um, continuing to archive Waze data. Now we provide monthly reports of Waze and 511 entries to our um, traffic management center. And then this year, sort of what I covered in our winter one is we added a bunch of more states to our surrounding states road conditions and we have also compacted that into one service now. So these statistics sort of of a lot of people in the millions use our, our services um, on a yearly basis. So this is one of the cool things I like to um, sort of point out that we do with FME. So here on the, the, the left, you have a Waze report. So that was reported at 3.08 p.m. And then you use FME, and so we, we uh, have an FME process that runs every five minutes. It sends a notification to our traffic management center that's able to take action on the reports um, with a uh, street address along with a mile post. And so the report was emailed and added to Oracle, but this was even before our traffic, notif or traffic management center even knew about it. So if we didn't have this FME process in place, they wouldn't even know that there was an accident. And it was a very major accident because if you look, is the whole road was eventually blocked, but then it's also um, LifeLight was in route. Um, so LifeLight, the, the um, helicopter, um, the air ambulance um, was in route. So it must have been a major accident for them to call um, LifeLight out. So if you look at the timestamps, so from this, is otherwise they would have never noticed it. But now since we have this Waze notification, it took them seven minutes to be able to, to, to call the um, sheriff's office and, and talk with them and make notification with them and, and get information about that. Otherwise, it wouldn't be, they wouldn't know to, or they wouldn't know about it necessarily because it happened on sort of a, a rural starts with road. So here's our ways process. It's a little convoluted. Um, you have the LRS stuff I just took out and I just put a transformer there but that adds a little bit. And then this is our, our big email notification. So we do testing on that. Um, we have um, what they call um, highway service boundary or highway service patrol boundary. So we do some filtering on that to notify if they're in, in a boundary. So if they're in a boundary, then we also pick up like stuff such as if they're on the shoulder of, shoulder of like an interstate or a route. Um, otherwise, we really don't care much about if a car's on the side of the shoulder or not. Um, and then we write it out and archive it. Some other noteworthy processes. Um, this one is actually in the hackathon thing I noticed, and um, I think I'm, if I have time, I might go present it over there again. Um, one of the cool things that we're doing is a bridge condition story map. So this actually just got featured in the Equipment World's Better Roads. Um, it's a big thing in the United States. Um, apparently, Iowa is ranked one of the worst states for bridges, but if you actually take the time and look at analysis, a lot of them are either on one lane roads of leading to dead end or dead end of the road or um, very low usage of the routes. Um, and so the other thing too is if you look at FHWA standards, of uh, those are actually, even though the most current data says 2016, it's actually 2015 data. So you have that two year lag cycle. This one is actually, we're slowly working once we get full integration with um, Esri Roads and Highways um, we're working to create a view um, that does a, a daily cycle. So we'll have that up there. So now some of our best practices learned. So um, this was our big storm that we had major issues with. We hit a peak of 268,000 um, requests in a single hour, which was really, really bad. Um, and we learned limits of ArcGIS Online that day. That was, that was fun. Um, so here's sort of our our major request. So we had for one particular day, we had over 5 million views, um, which was, that's quite a bit for ArcGIS Online, whoops. So now the big thing, feature services versus feature collections, what are they? So this is sort of the unspoken world of Esri. So feature services are database based. So they have limits based on Azure. 
versus feature collections. Feature collections are JSON files that are, are based on Amazon Web Services. So feature collections by default are now basically more highly robust and more high, high availability services. Um, so if you're looking for major big public applications, definitely use the bottom one. And some other sort of things that we learned through doing real-time high availability um, stuff um, ensure the public facing feature services are non-editable. Um, we have currently we use Python startup and shutdown scripts to do that. Um, we also use, actually in uh, uh, March of this year, the Artist Online release, they had a hosted feature layer um, thing that came out that basically what that allows you to do is now your editable REST service is you can, ha you can lock it down to only yourself to be able to edit. And then you can open up this view that basically is only a view only, sort of a read uh, view. And that basically works the same way. We haven't played around with that much um, because we haven't had much uh, free time to do that. But um, that's definitely something to look at. Um, also, the other big thing that they've told us to do is don't use filters on maps or on layers within maps and apps. Um, you can actually now do that within the hosted feature layer views. Um, which we do for the bridge application actually now. So it's really good stuff to do. And then best of all, just use feature collections. Um, I'm told after talking with Esri, or after talking with the FME people, um, it sounds like support is potentially coming in 2018 for that. Right now we have Python scripts. Um, oh, by the way, open data equals power. Um, so this is so this black screen is sort of if you were not open versus open where you can see multiple states. Um, I think this is a really cool graphic to see of the magic that you could do if you make your data open and accessible to other people. Um, thank you. And sort of what I was pointing out was the, um, my GitHub down there. We have um, source code um, that you can start using today for that doing creating Esri feature collections um, within shutdown script for FME. So with that, are there any questions? By the way, I'd like to point out before we do questions, with for, since Don is here, a lot of our, I think actually almost all of our like traffic operations and stuff, all that uses XML. So we read in everything with XML. <laughs> Using XFMAP, by the way, too. <laughs> Hi, I was just wondering the vendor that's providing the data every 10 or 15 seconds, uh, so, what, how are they doing that? What kind of technology are they using and what's the company called? So the company from up here is Skyhawk. Um, I forget where they're based at up here in Canada, somewhere. Um, but mainly is that they do, I don't know how they get the paint. I'm not on, so that's a whole different team in itself that manages all that winter operation stuff. We just pull the data from our databases that get it. And so our databases, we do a pull every minute, but what they do on the back end of things is that the vendor, I believe, does aggregation to the segments that we give them. Um, and they process that themselves, and then we just pull the aggregation to be able to do like the winter cost calculator stuff. But then we also do eventually get then in another process all of the points back down, all the pings. Yep. Any other questions? You guys are a quiet bunch. Did I scare you guys? Oh, one back there. So the question was about using Excel um, for, or using, what am I using for um, doing the monthly reports? And we use, basically it's a data dump, so we use Excel and we give it to them in, in an Excel format and they're able to, whoops, they're able to play around with that and, and um, get what they need out of that. Any other questions? If not, uh, you can come find me if you do have questions, otherwise you can, um, contact me with my information. And my presentation is up online. It's been up online for a little while. So hope to see more feature collections and more data out there. Thank you, David. Cool.